In this tutorial, we're going to be introducing the Bernoulli's equation, and we're going to be seeing how Bernoulli's equation can be applied to various different contextual problems. So at the top of the page, we have the Bernoulli's equation in its complete form. And whilst it looks quite complicated, as we'll see through these examples, it's quite rare that all of the terms in the equation apply to a given problem. So our starting point is always to decide which of these terms we need to use and which of these terms we can disregard. But if we move from left to right, first of all, we have P1. Now P1 is the pressure measured at a given position, or position one. And on our diagram, we're referring to position one as being just above the pump here. After P1, we have rho GZ1. Well, rho is the density of the fluid, g is gravity, and z is something that we call elevation. As we'll see in a moment, in our particular example here, z1 is actually going to be zero. Our third term relates to the velocity of the fluid. We have rho u1 squared over two. Note that in the Bernoulli's equation, and in fluid dynamics in general, we usually use u to represent velocity, because v is used to represent volume. On the right hand side, we have those three terms repeated, except this time we have subscript two. The reason we have subscript two is because we're referencing another position within the system. So in this example, we're referencing the fluid level in the top of this header tank. We then have density times gravity times elevation at point two, and this time we are going to have an elevation. We then have density times velocity squared over two for position two. And finally, we have any pressure losses, PL. So what we actually have here is an energy balance because the total energy at position one must equal the total energy at position two, taking any pressure losses into consideration. So let's take a look at our example and see which of these terms we actually need to use. Okay, so referring to position one first of all, we know that the fluid at position one is going to have a pressure. We have a pump delivering pressure here in the bottom left hand corner, and we also have hydrostatic pressure as a result of the fluid above that point. Our second term then, rho g z1, z1 or the elevation at position one is actually going to be zero. And the reason it's going to be zero is because we're using that lower position as our datum. There's no vertical elevation from that point. So referring back to our Bernoulli's equation, we're going to just disregard that term in the equation. If z1 zero, then the value of that term's going to be zero. Next we have rho u1 squared over two. Well, because the pump's being used to fill the tank, at position one, our fluid is going to have a velocity. It's going to be moving through the pipe like so. And that velocity can be determined because we have the volume flow rate for the fluid. And we'll talk a bit more about volume flow rate in a moment. But if there's volume flowing through the pipe, then that fluid must have a velocity. So now let's refer to position two and see which terms we can get rid of. Well, first of all, at position two, the pressure acting at this surface is atmospheric pressure. Now in an earlier tutorial, we talked about the difference between absolute and gauge pressure. And when we evaluate systems like this, we actually use the gauge pressure. Well, if we have atmosphere acting on that surface, the gauge pressure is just zero. And it's important to remember that whenever a tank or a pipe is exposed to atmosphere, the pressure is zero, zero gauge. So we lose that term. The next term is rho gz2. Well, if position one is at an elevation of zero, then position two is at an elevation of 15 meters. So rho gz2 is going to have a value. Next we have rho u2 squared over two. Now when we have large tanks, we can assume that the velocity is zero. The velocity of the fluid at this surface is going to be negligible when compared to the velocity of the fluid flowing through the pipe. So we're going to assume that the velocity at that point is zero. In actual fact, the only way we could calculate that velocity would be if we knew the diameter 
of this tank here, or the cross-sectional area of this tank. But for simplicity, we're going to ignore that term. And finally, we have the pressure loss, which is also stated in the question as 25 kilopascals. What I recommend is that you always write out the full Bernoulli's equation, as we see at the top of the page there, and then you go through the process that we've just been through in order to get rid of any terms that don't apply to the given scenario. You can then rewrite the Bernoulli's equation. We have P1 plus rho u1 squared over 2 equals rho gz2 plus any pressure losses. So we've simplified the Bernoulli's equation down to just four terms. Now in this example, we're going to be calculating P1. We want to know the pressure P1 measured on the gauge. So the first thing to do is to rearrange our Bernoulli's equation. Our Bernoulli's equation is going to become P1 equals rho gz2 plus the pressure loss. And to get P1 on its own, all I'm doing is subtracting this term here from each side, so minus rho u1 squared over 2. So we know the density, that's given in the question, here and here. We know gravity is 9.81, and we know the elevation at position 2. We know the pressure loss. The only thing that we don't know before we can calculate the pressure at position 1 is the velocity of the fluid at position 1 or the velocity of the fluid flowing through the pipe, as the velocity is going to be constant throughout that whole section of pipe. What we do have is a volume flow rate, and our volume flow rate is 2.5 decimeters cubed per second. Now this is quite an unusual unit, but it's quite commonly used in fluid dynamics, especially when we're looking at the delivery rates of pumps and compressors and so on. So you will see decimeters cubed, what we need to be able to do is to convert that into SI units. So just as an aside, one metre can be divided into 10 decimetres. A decimetre is basically 10 centimetres. So if we imagine we had a one metre rule like so, then that would be split into 10 decimetres. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 9, 10. So there's 10 decimeters in a meter. So to get from meters to decimeters, we times by 10. But if we look at our units, we don't want decimeters, we want decimeters cubed. So to get from 1 meter cubed to 1 decimeter cubed, we would need to times by 10 cubed. But in actual fact, we want to go the opposite way. We want to go from decimeters cubed to meters cubed. So if we reverse the arrow, we need to perform the inverse function. So divide by 10 cubed. And dividing by 10 cubed would take us from decimeters cubed to meters cubed. In actual fact, 10 cubed is a thousand, but it's always useful to think about converting volumes in this way because it would work for converting from centimetres cubed to metres cubed or millimetres cubed to metres cubed and so on. So it's useful to think of the linear scale factor times 10 and raise it to the power cubed. So if we have 2.5 decimetres cubed per second and we want to convert that into metres cubed per second, then we need to divide by 10 to the 3, or 1,000, which gives us 0 0.0025 meters cubed per second. If you prefer just to remember the conversion factor, then you divide by 1,000 to get from decimeters cubed per second to meters cubed per second. Let's add that value in meters cubed per second to our list of variables, and then we'll calculate our velocity. So in an earlier tutorial, we saw the formula for volume flow rate, Q, equals velocity, U, times area. We now know our volume flow rate in SI units, and our area can be calculated because we have the diameter of the pipe equal to 22 millimetres. 
So rearranging, we have u is just q over a, and the area of the pipe is pi r squared. It's a circular pipe. Well, if the diameter is 22 millimetres, then the radius is 11 millimetres, and dividing by 1,000 gives us 0 0.011 metres. Again, it's important to work in SI units. So our calculation for the velocity then is the flow rate, 0 0.0025, divided by pi times the radius squared, And that gives us a velocity at position 1 equal to 6.5767 metres per second. And that's accurate to four decimal places. So I'm going to add that velocity in the bottom left hand corner. And then we can carry out our final calculation in order to calculate the pressure on the gauge at position 1. OK, so plugging our values into the Bernoulli's equation, we have P1 equals density 1000 times gravity 9.81 times elevation at position 2, 15 metres. To that we need to add the pressure loss, which is 25 kilopascals, take care here because kilo is 1000, minus density 1000, times velocity squared, 6.5767, and this is why I used plenty of decimal places on that velocity, divided by 2. Now running that all through the calculator gives us a pressure at the gauge at position 1 equal to 150,524, or let's convert that to kilopascals, 150 0.5 kilopascals. So the pressure measured at the gauge at position 1 equals 150.5 kilopascals. In the next video we're going to look at a descriptive question where we're not given a diagram but an ideal starting point is to produce a sketch in order to determine which terms we can get rid of in the Bernoulli's equation.